Deuteronomy chapter 4. Uh, hear the word of the Lord. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and rules that I am teaching you and do them that you may live and go in and take possession of the land of, that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of Peor. But you who hold fast to the Lord your God are all alive today. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For, that, for what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children how on the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children so. Uh, and you came near the, and stood at the foot of the mountain while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud and gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. And he declared to you his covenant which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and rules that you might do them in the land that you are going over to possess. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on that day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, and the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. Uh, and beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of, the iron, out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people of his own inheritance as you are this day. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me because of you, and he swore that I should not cross the Jordan and that I should not enter the good land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. But I must die in this land. I must not go over the Jordan, but you shall go over. And take possession of that good land. Take care lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made with you. And make a carved image the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. A jealous God. When you father children and children's children and have grown old in the land. If you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything. And by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God. So as to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over to the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will, will drive you. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there... You will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. For ask now of the days that are past, which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth and ask from one end of heaven to the other whether such great, a great thing as this has ever happened or was, was ever heard of 
Did any people ever hear the voice of a God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and still live? Or has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, and by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great deeds of terror, all of which the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. Out of heaven he let you hear his voice, that he might discipline you. And on earth he let you see his great fire. Uh, and you hear his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers and chose their offspring after them and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his mighty power, driving out before you na nations greater and mightier than yourselves to bring you in, to give you their land for an inheritance as it is this day. Know therefore today and lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. Therefore, you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for all time. Then Moses set apart three cities in the east beyond the Jordan, that the manslayer might flee there. Anyone who kills his neighbor unintentionally without being at enmity with him in time past, he may flee to one of these cities and save his life. Bezer in the wilderness on the tableland uh, for, the, for the Reubenites, Ramoth in Gilead for the Gadites, and Golan in Bashan for the Manassites. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. It's a long passage, wasn't it? Oh, phew. Well, if you had to be deaf or blind, which would you choose? Uh, in other words, which sense uh, would you rather do without? Hearing or seeing? It's a hard choice, isn't it? Because we'd hate to be without either one. Uh, you know, one study, because it, you know, it's hard to say which is worse. So one study said that, that deaf people have higher levels of depression than blind people do. But another study showed that deaf people report higher levels of satisfaction with life than blind people do. The fact is, we need sight and sound. There's nothing like a, a calming voice, a beautiful music, or birds singing, in the waking up to that in the morning. There's also nothing like sunshine on a spring day, a warm smile, uh, the green trees, and red flowers, blue skies, and white clouds. Wouldn't you hate to be without either one? Well, the worst, of course, would be to be without both, uh, bo you know, both deaf and blind, without hearing and seeing. Because, you know, if, even if you, you can't see, if you're blind, you can, you can hear books and letters narrated to you. You can hear people talk to you. You might not could text without Braille or Siri, uh, but you could, you could talk to other people on the phone. Um, if you couldn't hear, if you were deaf, you could still read. You could text other people, and people could text you. You could, quote, chat online. People could communicate with you, and you could communicate with them. But if you lost both, you would be completely shut off. That's what happened to Helen Keller. At 18 months old, she got a disease uh, that left her both deaf and blind. And so for years, and this is early 20th century, uh, so for years, or maybe it was late 19th century, around that time, uh, for years, though, she, or like the first six years of her life, she was completely cut off from all communication until a teacher named Ann Sullivan broke through to her by, um, by making signs into her hand, you know, moving her fingers and doing signs into her hand that she could feel. And, um, of course, it took a while to, for her to, Helen Keller to figure out the signs were meaning things um, of, of what things were. And the first word that Helen Keller learned was, was water as Ann Sullivan held out one of her hands under flowing, Helen Keller's hands under flowing water from a well and then made the sign for water into her hand. And it finally dawned on Helen that the signs into her hand uh, were about the water. And then she wanted to know what everything else meant. So she finally got the connection. The signs were the things. Now, other, now what does everything else mean? After a while, she just learned the whole language that way. 
and she was able to write books and articles and became an international celebrity. Uh, Ann Sullivan was called the miracle worker for, for teaching Helen. A popular play was made about them, particularly about that moment where they broke through to her at the well, called the miracle worker. It, it took, of course, having to break through, her not being able to see and hear. We're meant to see and hear. If you're if, you're, if you were like Helen Keller and you couldn't see or hear, you would, you would know you need to break through. You need some help. You need someone like Ann Sullivan. You need a miracle worker to break through the limitations, to communicate, to learn about the world, to experience a reality that's outside of your own mind. You know, if you're like her, you know you're limited, you're handicapped, that you need help, maybe a miracle. But if, if you can see and hear, you have another handicap. You might think reality is only what you can see. That there's nothing beyond what can be seen. That's a handicap. You might not know which of the many voices out there that you should be listening to. You might only hear the ones, you know, you might only agree with the ones, that you obey the ones that agree with the voice in your head. You might be just as constrained as Helen Keller was. You just don't know it. And so you, too, need a miracle worker. And we see that here in this passage, Deuteronomy 4, in four major parts, the, the commandments, the consuming fire, uh, third, the covenant, and finally, the consideration. First, the commandments. Moses is continuing his, what, basically like a commencement address. It's that time of year, graduation time. Israel has graduated from wandering in the desert, and now they've got an appetizer of the promised land. And now, O Israel, Moses says to them, this is sort of a concluding, this chapter 4 of of this first major speech of Deuteronomy. Now, O Israel, listen. What do you hear, Israel? What do you hear? Well, if you fill fill your time listening to the world, to its enticements, to its advertising for the good life, what it says is the promised land, you may not be able to hear the Lord. So here, Israel... Moses says, hear the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you. Listen to them. Listen to, the, listen to them, not just for the comfort of the familiar. Well, we've heard of this all before. Moses, this is all stuff we've gone through before. It, just the soothing sounds of the old-time religion. This, you know, like Some people like listening to hymns, but it doesn't change how they live. They're still just as adulterous or materialistic or racist or whatever. They're living for the expensive vacations and the nice cars and the big houses. No, listen and do them. You, don't, you know, you don't get any advantage coming to church, hearing the word of God, if you don't do it, right? It's not just, this isn't like a concert. It's entertaining words, and you go away entertained. I hope you're entertained. Maybe you're not. <laughs> I'm, I'm presuming too much, I guess. But anyway, it's not just if you hear the word and you go away unchanged as though somehow that's an advantage to you. It's not. In fact, you get in greater trouble because to whom much is given, much is required, uh, you, you are to do God's word in verse 1, that you may live. You, you have life so you can take possession of the promised land. So you hear, in other words, hear, the, hear that. The word of God comes, you believe it, you do it, and that gives you life. You have the promised land. The Lord is giving it to you, but you need the word of God to give you life so you can get it. But you got to do it. And you don't add to the word. Remember, he says that right off there, verse 2. Don't add to it maybe what you are sure uh, it should say. Maybe you're so sure you think it really does say that, but it really doesn't. Um, But you'll find a way to insert it in there. Maybe add a prohibition that you just think it's got to have, um, but it doesn't really contain. You know, like against all alcohol or against all dancing or something like that. Christians have been so sure past few generations, it just must prohibit those things. They'll find a way to squeeze out those prohibitions, uh, those laws out of it, even though it's not really there. Maybe they want to hear their favorite stories about the end times. And it doesn't matter how many verses they have to take out of context and string them together uh, from one passage to another, jumping from one half-baked conclusion to another. Uh, they're just so sure that it's there, they won't listen to anything else. They, they want to hear what they want to hear And so they somehow hear that uh, from the word of God. 
don't do that, he says. You're adding to the word. Don't take away from the word. What's, what's not, what, what is there? Even when it's convenient. In other words, the, the, the Bible, what it says is so inconvenient, you just find it too hard to believe. And so you, you, can't, you can't do that. You can't really mean that. Be careful, by the way. A, a, a test when you're probably hearing false doctrine, some passages of the Bible that just sound so radical, and someone comes along and just waters it down so much that at the end of it, it basically ends up meaning nothing. It's kind of like, carry on. You know, no change. They're probably taking something out of the Bible when they do that. Many churches of the last generation or two have found the instructions about church discipline to be, to be just too strange, too hard, too idealistic. What in the world are you talking about? Treat them as a, you know, go, go through these steps of confronting and all that. After all, who's going to stay around and have their sins exposed? That just doesn't happen, does it? Think of what Jesus says in Matthew 18. Is anyone going to stay around for that? No, let's go to another church. And we can't really do anything about that, can we? But, it's, but it, you know, it's not as though that passage, using an example, it's hard to understand. Matthew 18, verses 16 to 18, is one of the easiest passages to understand. It's just clear, step-by-step -step instructions. It's just hard to do especially as it is built on the assumption about what the church is that many Christians today don't see and don't hear. You know, if you see the church as like a theater or maybe like a restaurant, and if that's your view of the church, you can't hear what the Lord Jesus is saying in Matthew 18 because it's just, your vision is obscured by what you, what you think you see. But that and everything else it says you must keep in verse 2. Don't take away from it. Don't add to it. Keep it. Th these are the commandments of the Lord our God. We need to hear them and to do them. Uh, uh, that's what you hear. What do you see? Here they saw with their own eyes what the Lord did at Baal, Peor. That's how you say that word. Americans you say Baal, okay, but it's supposed to say Baal. Uh, or, or it could be Beth Peor, which means house of Peor. And, that, and, and if the story comes, if you remember from the book of Numbers, uh, there at Balaam's suggestion, the people of Moab tried to seduce many of the Israelites into the worship of this god Baal of Peor. Peor is the town, and the Baal was the god there, uh, which included, this, uh, the worship of this god included sex as part of the worship of adultery, probably with these prostitutes who came with the shrines. And when they, some of the Israelites got involved in that, the Lord had a plague break out among them. And the Lord then told Moses to hang the chiefs of Israel who turned to Baal, who, who went after this God, hang them, you know, by a rope we're talking about, I guess, or from a, from a tree or something. And then Moses told the judges to go out into the congregation, out into the nation, and kill the men who had turned to Baal. Phinehas, Aaron's son, uh, when he saw an, an Israelite taking a pagan woman with him, an open view. This is like Moses, and you can imagine Moses and Aaron and Phineas are hanging around talking. And this is, how, how, what are we going to do with this horrible situation? So many of our people are being seduced by this pagan god. And there's this Israelite man right in front of them, taking this, this woman, this prostitute with him, into his tent. And Phineas there, it's probably a young man, son of Aaron, he is, he is indignant. He is zealous for the Lord. And so he gets a spear, and he follows them, these two, into their tent, and he spears them to death with one strike. And the Lord declared that Phineas's jealousy for the Lord, that it, that appeased God's wrath at, at them, at Israel, so that he didn't consume the whole nation because of what Phineas did, because of his zeal for the Lord. But 24,000 Israelites died there, and the rest of the people had, had seen that. Moses is reminding them of that here. Your eyes have seen. What do you see? Well, your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor in verse 3. You can see what God does. Uh, you can learn what God is like by seeing what God does. He destroyed from among you, Moses tells them, those who sinned. Okay, this wasn't just a disease that's happened to strike just at that time. It's a coincidence. This Phineas, he's a hot-headed young man. He shouldn't have done that. No, see what the Lord did. But you, held fa but you who held fast to the Lord your God, like being faithful in a marriage, are still alive today. And they could see that too. What do you see? 
uh, in verse 5, see. We're commanded to see. Open your eyes and see. Pay attention. That we've been taught statutes and rules. Uh, we've, been, we've been taught that, not simply that we would know them. Oh, that's interesting. You know, it's just trivia. Uh, to be knowledgeable about what the Lord has commanded, but that you should do them. I think some modern evangelical Christians, you know, so want to prove that they're not legalistic. They're too cool to be legalistic. They understand that the gospel, and it's right, the gospel is about God saying done, not about telling us to do. Okay, we have a lot of those. And some reform people uh, who want to show how sophisticated they are, how smart they are, how they have all their theology, their fancy theology, they have it nailed down, that they can quote the Heidelberg Catechism on justification or define imputed righteousness. They can define it perfectly. They have fine-tuned their doctrine. A lot of those miss this. Do. Now, sure, our being accepted by God, becoming his children, the, the, is by his work. The, the word became flesh and gave us power to become the children of God. That is by what God has done. Uh, it is finished, Jesus declared from the cross. He's done our salvation. But now that that is done... That doesn't mean that we don't have to do. I see some reform people who love the reform books and the reform podcast and uh, to talk, reform theology, but you can't get them to do anything. Right? Mary, Mary and I went to a reformed church this week. We tried to help them you know, in, like over 10 years ago. But, but you know, they won't give, they won't reach out, they won't be active with the church, they won't pick up some kids that want to come to church. There's, you know, they just want to come and talk theology. Honestly, I'd rather have an Armenian with confused theology, at least on some secondary points, but who is seriously wanting to be a disciple of Jesus, who wants to do everything that he's commanded. The, the, you know, the Lord Jesus did not commission us to go and make theologians who talk theology. He didn't. He taught us to go and make disciples. Those are disciplined people of all nations. That means all ethnic groups, all races, teaching them to what? Observe to do, to practice, to live everything I have commanded you. Now that God has done, you need to do. Well, that's the situation these people were in. Israel wasn't saved by keeping the law, were they? Can't you think this is legalism? No, they weren't saved by keeping the law. Uh, they were first saved from Egypt through the sea, and then... After they're saved, they're given the law. Salvation comes first, and then God gives us his, his statutes, his principles, his word, and we are to do it. In verse 6, keep them and do them. Don't just talk about them. For that, doing God's word, he says, will be your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the peoples. If you do it, people will say, wow, look at these people. They're, 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 their life is different. It's impressive. People around us see us living God's word and are amazed. Take the scriptures, for example, that we pledge to in our church covenant. Think how revolutionary they would be if implemented. We walk together in Christian love. From 2 John, verse 6, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. You know, you know, that's not just being smiley on Sunday morning and friendly and shaking hands and asking Daniel how he's doing. It's been a while. Uh, but if a member needs something, a roof repaired, a lawn mowed, a dog looked after. Where's, Mary's not here, but Wayne helped. Uh, uh, we, we don't forsake the assembling. Uh, you know, that's, it's doing that stuff. Uh, we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. We're slow to take offense. Is he talking about me? I'm going somewhere else. Uh, but always ready for reconciliation. From James chapter 1, verse 19. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 to 26. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. We faithfully admonish one another. Faithfully means if they need admonish, can be correcting, it can be encouraging, but it's, it's helping each other get out, helping each other be better. You know, to enable each other's sins, even just passively letting them slide. That's from Galat Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. We have a steadfast love. Like in Ruth, remember Hesed? Steadfast love that endures all things. From 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7. Everyone loves 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The love chapter. 
What is love? It endures all things. I hate to sound like I'm talking down theological precision, the tr you know, truth about God, because I love sound theology, but we can have a perfectly fine-tuned theology in the world is it going to care? No, God cares, but the world, as far as in the sight of the peoples that God's talking about here in this passage, the world isn't going to care. But here it is when we do God's word, when we put it into practice, that people will be impressed. They'll say in verse 6, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Because of what they do. Because it's when we put God's word into practice, that's when people around us can see as in verse 7, that God is among us, that we're not just another self-serving club, you know, full of individuals, just all out for ourselves. They see the work of God by us obeying the word of God. Did you get that? They see, people around us, the work of God by us obeying the word of God. They see that he is near us. He's giving us grace. He's giving us power whenever we call upon him. As someone said, we may be the only Bible that, that some people read. And if what they see and hear in us is the word of God lived out, then they'll know, as in verse 8, that we have something that is, wow, righteous, they'll say. What, a, what great nation, they say, or a people is there that has statutes and rules, commandments, so righteous. So starting in verse 9, take care. Be careful. Keep your soul diligently. Now, if you want to keep your body diligently, say you want to get in shape, physical shape, uh, you have to take care about your diet. You have to take care. You have to be diligent. You can't have every treat you want. Uh, you'll have to work out, often strenuously, almost every day. You have, to, you have to do it diligently. You have to apply yourself. It doesn't come easily. So if you want to be a disciple of Jesus who observes all that he's commanded... Take care to keep your soul diligently. That means you can't watch or listen to everything you might want. Uh, you have to apply yourself to, to remember the word of God. You should, you should read it for yourself. Listen to those who preach it soundly. Maybe listen to music that reminds you of it, lest you forget what your eyes have seen. That's what a lot of this is about. That's what we're trying to do right now. Uh, remind you of what God's word says remind you of God's word so you don't forget God's work and then in verse 9 make them known God's words and in his works make them known to your children and your grandchildren teach them so that in verse 10 they learn to fear the Lord to revere him to, to tremble at his word and that they might then they will pass it on to their children well here these people Forty years ago, when some of them were just children, they stood at the foot of Mount Sinai uh, as it burned and smoked and clouds covered it and the Lord's voice boomed out of it. What did they hear? The word of God. And they trembled. What did they see? No form. They, they saw only what God had done, the, the fire, the smoke, not the Lord himself. They heard the word of God. They saw the works of God. So there's the commandments. Next is the consuming fire. Therefore, in verse 15, because he's made a covenant with us uh, with, with stipulations, with requirements, things we are to do, to observe. Not just theology to know, but things to do. What he's done should produce our doing. Because of that, watch yourselves very carefully, he says. You know, this isn't an easy believism, that it doesn't matter how you live, because, you know, grace will cover up everything, whatever, you know, be nice if you a little better, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter, God will let everything slide. No, grace is what gets you in a covenant with God, reveals the Lord to you, and enables you to, to be very careful. Uh, and if you're not very careful, if the Bible and prayer aren't that important to you, so you hardly read it and hardly pray, if church isn't so important, so you figure you can miss pretty regularly, and you, you, you don't even worry about making up through other means. If, if you're not careful, that suggests maybe you've never seen his work or heard his word, or 
you are forgetting what you saw and heard. Here, be very careful to remember that you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you. They saw no form. We see no form. So don't make an image that you use in worship. Now here, I'm supposed to say, you probably expected me to say something like, um, you know, okay, you know, we don't use idols, but we all know we don't use idols. Uh, it's just so far out of our mind. We'll never do that. So then what we're to do is don't make idols out of cars or jewelry or money or success or sports or relationships or covetousness. You know, covetousness is materialism, greed. That is idolatry. You expect me to go right to that, right? Um, well, true. Uh, that's all true that those things are idolatry. But we still need to be careful that we don't slip into making literal idols. You may think that's just so far out. We'll, we'll never do that. But actually, you can't drive through Dan, Danville without going right by some idols. Right down 86, right across from GW High School, there's several idols set up right there. Okay? But, uh, you know, so don't think that's really so far out that that'll never happen to you. People have all throughout all history, all kinds of people, all kinds of cultures, have, people have an urge to reduce God to an image that they can see. Just because we live in a mostly Protestant culture that doesn't have a lot of literal idols, does it mean that that sinful urge has gone away? It's not. Just in the last few months, I've written an academic article about how the Eastern Orthodox Church draws many evangelical Christians in to them uh, and gets them to accept what they call their icons, uh, which are really just idols. Uh, it sh it, that article should be published in the Thymialus, how do you say that word, journal, uh, in December. Now, the Eastern Orthodox claim to have preserved the practices of the early church. This is their claim they make. They, may very, they put it out there, and this is how they draw in a lot of Christians uh, to join them, because they'll say, we have the practices of the early church preserved from the beginning, unaltered. We have never changed a thing from the day of the apostles. Okay, they, they say that clearly, strongly, and that's, their, that's sort of their selling point. But they use icons in worship. Um, and I proved in my article, I think I proved it pretty clearly, that the early church, the, early, the real early church, and I'm talking about the first four centuries of Christianity, uh, strictly prohibited icons. That, they, that is, that they had no images in, in their worship. They, the, the, no likenesses of any figure. The, the early church saw that doing that, using any images in worship, uh, like just as Moses does here, uh, they saw that as acting corruptly. That's the real early church. But over the centuries, as superficially converted pagan people came into the church, they brought their idols with them, and eventually, by the year 787, uh, icons were accepted. And so don't think it could happen to the early church. It took about 700 years, but don't think if, if it happened to them that it can't happen to us if we're not careful. We have to be careful. But yes, as for now, you need to be careful about the idolatry of covetousness, of living for wealth, the nice car, the big house, the newest gadgets, the sweetest relationship, even the idol of the family. Uh, beware in verse 19, lest you, you, it says you raise your eyes to those things. That's what gives you hope. That's what gives you tr truth. That's what your firm foundation is. The husband, the wife, the, the money, the cash in the bank, the big house, the stuff. It's that stuff. And you serve them. So you can't come to church on Sunday morning because you've got to serve the money God. Yeah, you wish you could do both, but, but you know, you got to serve the money God. So you go, you go serve that God. You break your covenant to the church because the family God tells you to. Beware. Uh, we heard a testimony, and I'm sorry, somebody missed it in Sunday school. This man, Nabil Qureshi, converted from Islam, and he quite clearly had to make a decision between his faith in Jesus and his family. And we still are calling people to make that decision today. Him, it's a radical decision. Somehow, Christians among us still have to make that. And somehow, many of them delude themselves that they can't, and they're just compromising. You might think that there is no price to be paid, that God won't be angry after all. He, after all, he's all about focusing on the family, isn't he? 
or he is so gracious, so lenient and indulgent, that's what some people think grace is, uh, that we don't need to worry, worry about his, any, any wrath from him. But beware, the Lord here says here, he is jealous. He's jealous for the affections of the people he saved. He brought Israel out of the iron furnace of Egypt in verse 20. He's brought us out of the bondage to sin, out, us out of the iron furnace of God's eternal wrath to be a holy nation, a people for his own inheritance, to belong to him. You can't see him, but you can see what he's done. He punished our sins on his beloved son on the cross. Uh, we look at the cross. There's God's work. We look at the cross. Sure, we, uh, most of the time we, we emphasize God's love. The second person of the Trinity, the son, giving himself for our sins. Sure, that says that. We can see that in the cross. But guess what's also there on the cross? Also, God's wrath in the first person of the Trinity, the father, is there. On the, he's punishing the son because of our sins. It's not just the Romans and the Jews and the enemies doing it. It's the father punishing the son for our sins on the cross. That's what you see. That's God's work on the cross. And we can see the wrath of God at sin, at our sin. What kind of God do you see by his works? Well, Moses tells them here in verse 21, Look at the fact that he, Moses, he can't enter the promised land. The Lord was angry with me because of you. Talk to that because of you last, about that because of you part last week. Uh, but here, uh, he, he's not an indulgent God. He just kind of lets everything slide. See what kind of God he is by what he, he's, he does. In verse 22, Moses says, I must die in this land. And it's like, oh, this has come upon me. I can't get the promise. He doesn't get to cross the Jordan to the promised land. Now, we might think, hey, Moses was so faithful for so many years. He's probably like 120 years old at this time. He's really old. You think after all that faithfulness to the Lord, he, he's earned some leniency from God. He's earned, you know, God should let some things slide for him for all these years of faithful service. But because he was given more, more was required of him. See that and see how holy the Lord is. And they, they will go over, Israel will, will, and when they do, remember to take care. In verse 23, be very careful. Be careful lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God. You know, this is why we take the Lord's Supper once a month. Well, you know, we, we only get baptized once, but why are we taking the Lord's Supper over and over and over again? Why not just take it once in our life? No, we do it once a month. We could do it more often for that. It wouldn't be a bad idea to take it every week. Uh, why we usually use that as an opportunity to remind ourselves of the stipulations of God's covenant. To, that we do that to be careful, to remind ourselves, be careful that we don't forget God's covenant with us. Because in verse 24, here's the conclusion. What do you, what do you see? What, do you, what you can see about God from what he's done, from his works. The Lord your God is a consuming fire. If that's the God you can see in your mind, the one you can't see in your eye, with your eyes, well, that's good. If, if he's not, if, you, if, you don't, if that's not the God you see in your mind, if he's not a consuming fire, not a holy, holy, holy God who makes you cry out like Isaiah, woe is me, I am unclean. If that's not the God you can see, then you're blind. What do you see? What do you hear? Do you hear God's covenant? Before, in verse 13, Moses mentioned the covenant. Covenants bind us to him and him to us. Now, in their day, covenants had, had typical parts. It was a typical way, particularly like treaties between countries, nations, between a, 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 a great king with a big empire and a smaller and little tiny nation with a, a small king. They had typical parts, though, they were used to. They were uh, witnesses. They would call witnesses to account. Look, we made a covenant. Stipulations, penalties for breaking them. Here, starting in verse 25, he says that when, they, when we have children and grandchildren, if we act corruptly, we serve an idol, either the literal one, like an icon, or a figurative one, like, like money, family, then we break the covenant. And so we stoke that consuming fire 
It's like pouring gasoline on a fire. It'll burn. And the word of God declared his covenant, his commitment to them. A covenant has stipulations, his requirements, what you are to do. Like great kings in their day. Say a king of a big empire, an emperor, would make a covenant with some other smaller nation. And here's, here's the covenant. Here's the stipulations. Well, the promise I make, I won't destroy you. You will live if, here's the stipulations, you do such and such. Maybe pay me so much money every year. You know, you've got to hand it over. Now, that's, you know, not very good negotiating position. If you don't, I'll destroy you. Uh, or join with me, send, some, send an army with, me, with my army, and we'll go attack this other country. Like that. Uh, the covenants would then, that's the stipulations, the covenants would then have witnesses, usually the gods that the great king believed in. In other words, you know, if he believed in Baal, may Baal witness this covenant and enforce it. Here, Moses calls heaven and earth to witness the covenant uh, and, because the covenant is between the Lord and his people. Uh, the Lord is the great king, and Israel is the nation that he is covenanting with. The stipulations, what Israel is to do, are what we know as the Ten Commandments. This is what I'm requiring you to do. You don't have to give me so much money. You have to give me a, your life. You know, no other gods. Don't make any idols. No, 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 no. This is what you are to do. The Lord wrote them down and gave them a copy so that they would know that these are, are what we are to do in this covenant. Covenants have a blessings if you keep them, curses if you break them. Deuteronomy will go into a lot more details about the blessings and curses of the covenant in chapter 28. But for now, he says in verse 26, if you break the covenant, you will utterly perish from the land. You will not live long. You'll be scattered. You'll be left few in number in verse 27. He says, he, says, he says, you break the covenant, you'll be driven out to other nations um, because of your idolatry. And their, uh, their punishment, your punishment will be, ironically, they, 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 they bow before idols, they, they, they embrace idolatry, and the, their punishment in verse 28 is that they will, serve other, they will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. In other words, they chose idolatry, and so they will be given over to idolatry, to, to deaf and blind idols. That's what they chose. But that tribulation, they're cast out to the nations as, as punishment for breaking the covenant. The trouble, tribulation comes to them, trouble because of their sins that the Lord inflicts on them, driven out among the nations. That will result in verse 29 in them seeking the Lord. If they search for him with all their heart, then they will find him. Uh, they will turn to him and obey his voice. They will observe all his teachings. That's the covenant. Uh, witnesses, uh, stipulations, curses for those who break them, and blessings for those who, from their trials, seek the Lord with all their heart, and he saves them. Th they hear him. Trouble has come on them. They cry out. They, they listen for his voice. They hear him. And then they do what they hear. The Lord Jesus gave us a new covenant. Uh, that's what we remember in the Lord's Supper. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That's what was done on the cross. We have stipulations now too. You know, observing everything that he has commanded. Uh, those who don't observe them. Maybe they go out from the church. They show they were never one of God's people in the first place. Um, that They show their, you know, are they ever really in a covenant? It's, it's God's people, uh, sheep who are scattered in many sheepfolds. Uh, tribulation comes. Often that's the way God uses to bring his people to himself. Tribulation, trials, trouble. Tribu trouble comes to them, and that causes them to seek the Lord with all their heart. And so he finds his sheep. They have marital trouble or immigration trouble. We've had some come to us because of that, because of, thanks to the immigration department. Uh, money trouble, health trouble. And so they cry out to God, and they listen to whatever he says, and they do it. His sheep hear his voice and follow. The Lord has made a covenant with his people uh, to save his people, and he'll save them no matter where they are. They're being scattered in all ethnic groups, all nations, 
Uh, he'll find them. He may use trouble to find them, but he'll find them in verse 31. And here's, the, here's another conclusion. First conclusion about God, you remember? He's a consuming fire. Here's the second conclusion in verse 31. Here's also something you can see about God from his works. He's finding his people wherever they are. The Lord your God is a merciful God. You can see that in the cross too. You can see it in the Lord's Supper and the kindness and the severity of God. God's kindness to you who seek for him with all your heart. Is that the God you can see through his works? The God who will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant. He doesn't forget his covenant with his people. No matter where they are, he finds them. He keeps them. Well, if not, if you can't, sit or the, you can't see that yet, okay, consider something. For your consideration, let's review what the Lord has done in the past. What, what, what you can see of his works. See, see the Lord from his works. Hear his word. Uh, Moses says, ask. Ask about the past. Get a history lesson about what God has done. Consider whether, God, whether what God has done with Israel has ever happened to anyone else. In verse 33, did any people ever hear the voice of, of a God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as you have heard, and still live? See that the Lord is merciful by what he's done. He, he took them out of Egypt by trials and signs and wonders and, and war and a mighty hand by great deeds of terror, terror to his enemies, to whom he is a consuming fire. He did it, Moses says at the end of verse 34, before your eyes. You can see his works. To you it was shown in verse 35. Again, you can see what he does. He, 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 he might be invisible, but what he does is visible. He shows us who he is so that we can see it. He shows himself in his works that you might know that the Lord is God and there is no other beside him. Can you see that? The Lord is God. There is no other. He's not just the American God. We worship here because we're in America. You go back to China, you worship, you, go, you do the Chinese thing, the three religions. No, he's, he is the Lord. There is no other. Nowhere else. Can you see that? Can you hear him? Uh, out of heaven, he let you hear his voice. In verse 36, the, the word of God came from heaven for them at Sinai. The word of God came from heaven for us and became flesh and dwelt among us. He did it that he might discipline, Moses says here, disciple, teach us to observe everything that he has commanded. You can see his great fire. You can hear his words out of the fire. You can see his works and hear his words because in verse 37, he loved us. Hear, hear your fathers, Abraham and his offspring, Christ is the offspring of Abraham. Those he has covenanted with are in Christ. He sees us. You're one of those he's covenanted with. He sees us as, as under Christ's headship, as, as one of his people. He loves Christ, and so he loves us. We come with him. We're a package deal. We can see who he is by his works. We can hear his words because he loved us. He chose us. Notice that here. He, he chose Israel first. And then, because of his choice, he brought them out of Egypt. For us, he chose us first. And then, because of his loving choice, he brought us out of sin, out of the iron furnace of his wrath. He, his choice comes first. Then our salvation. And then our faith. And then everything we do. So he reigns now putting all his enemies under his feet, like Joshua, to whom he's speaking here, it's among, among those, the leader, the next leader of Israel that he, Moses is speaking to here, that Joshua literally put Israel's enemies under his feet in the promised land. At one point, he literally does that. Uh, here, the Lord is ruling now to give us an inheritance, the new heaven and the new earth. So know, therefore, from what you can hear from God's word. What do you hear? 
and what you can see from God's works. This is another conclusion in verse 39. Two, we've had two other conclusions about God. He's a consuming fire. He is merciful. Here, conclude from what can, can be considered. Lay it to heart, he says, so you don't forget. The third conclusion, that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath, everywhere on the earth, not just one nation, all nations. You can see it, see that. You can hear it. There is no other. And seeing that, hearing that, you consider that you must not just be a spectator of God's works, not just a hearer of God's words, like, like in an, uh, uh, someone at a concert. You must, in verse 40, keep his commandments. Again, you do them. God has done, so now we do. So what do you see? What do you hear? Three cities east of the Jordan? What's that about? You know, it's, well, it's for your consideration. Israel was supposed to have select cities that were refuges in case someone accidentally killed somebody. A, a manslayer is called in verse 42. So when they crossed the promised land, they were supposed to have these cities of refuge that um, the people could flee to. Um, because if you know, they accidentally killed someone and the family, say, of the unintentionally killed person doesn't believe it was unintentional. And so they're out for blood. And uh, you, the unintentional killer could flee to that city of refuge for protection from the vendetta. And the elders there would decide if this is for real, if he deserved the protection. Well, that was supposed to be what they would happen when they crossed into the promised land. Now, if this land east of the Jordan that we talked about last week, if this is really part of the promised land, then they needed some cities too, some of these cities of refuge. So, what, so that's what Moses does. He gives them these cities of refuge. So what we see in the cities of refuge is proof, proof you can see, that the Lord had already brought Israel into the promised land, had, had begun that. Not fully, but they're, they're, they're started. People around us should be able to see in our lives, in our church, that we have already entered the promised land, at least in part. That it's not just something we're always singing about in the, in the future, some glory, you know, I'll fly away and go there. But we have a victory now, some victory now, over the ongoing practice of sin. We don't live for the dollars of the people uh, around us. For the, we're different from the world around us. We have a hope uh, that, that lasts even when we suffer from some of the promises that are still not yet. We have that hope because we're in the promised land already. And others can see it. Do you see that in your life? Can it be seen already? That you're in the promised land. Can other people see that you've heard the word of God? They might not be able to hear it themselves yet. They may be blind to it. They may be deaf to it. But can they see it in your life? Three conclusions about God here. He's a consuming fire. He's holy. He's merciful. And he's the only God. Not money or family or whatever idol we make. Can it be seen in your works that you've heard those words from God? Can people see the work of God in your life? That you are one of the people that he has covenanted with from before creation. That he has made you a child of God. He is the miracle worker who reveals himself to us deaf and blind sinners. So No one has ever seen God, but the word of God, uh, the God who was begotten and became flesh, has made him known. If you want to see what God is like, wrath and mercy, grace and truth, steadfast love, chesed, and holiness. Look at the word. Look at the son. And having seen him and heard him, if you believe in him and observe everything that he's commanded, be his disciple and follow him into that promised land.